Welcome to Title Unboxed. With more than 40 years of experience in the fight game, our host, Doug Ward, will be covering every corner of the ring as we get comfortable between the ropes. We'll talk with both the lesser knowns and the legends, discuss boxing's rich history and current state of the game. We'll also look at today's latest innovations, equipment breakdowns, and insights you won't uncover anywhere else. Join us now as we take a look inside Title Unboxed. Our next guest is a boxing pioneer. In 2010, he was inducted into the Missouri Boxing Hall of Fame. He is the former boxing coach of 26 professional world champions and 34 Olympians. Joining us for this episode is the renowned trainer, Kenny Adams. Kenny Adams, welcome to Title Unboxed. Great to have you. Hey, thank you, my brother. Nice to be here. Well, and I guess we're joining you on a very special day, right? Yes, Doug. Uh, I'm uh, 80 years young today. Well, you look awesome. You look great. Thank you. Thank you. You don't, you don't look a day over 25-ish. Oh, uh, that's <laughs> the way I feel. <laughs> right on. Well, I want to start out with uh, I want to start with it with a story because I think it's it's a okay. little ironic. Um, okay. You and I met probably it's probably a bit probably been almost thirty years ago, and I was putting together days. a training series, and you were one of the coaches featured, and you said um, you you said yeah I'd love to do it. I, I want to bring a, fi a a young fighter I have with me though because it, it'll look better. We're more familiar with each other, and uh, you brought this young undefeated kid. Little did we know at that time it was going to be who? Diego Corrales, world yep. champion. Yep. We thought, well, this kid's good. He's got a good technique. He got a little bit of pop in his punches. Who would have known that he would have materialized and become what he what he did? I mean, he's legendary. Yes. Yeah. What made what made he, what he, made, he, he, he was a wonderful kid. He was a good kid. Uh, uh, you know, I uh, some Cameron Duncan brought him to me. And uh, he said, I got a young kid. I want you to train. I said, okay, uh, fine. You know, and he brought him in. He, I think he had gotten as far as the, the final of the Olympic trials. And uh, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, it's all good, you know. So he brought him to me and we started working. Uh, you know, he's a good kid. He could punch long and tall for his weight. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of particulars, you know. And one of the nicest guys out of the ring. I mean, always went out of his way to say hi and have a conversation, regardless of how yeah, many he's people very are nice. around. You don't run into yeah, those guys. Yeah, he was always very a very nice guy. Good people. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if very many, let's start from the beginning. I don't know if very many, very many people know, but you actually started out as a fighter. You weren't originally a trainer. Um, no. How old were you when you started boxing? 10 years old. 10 years old. And we, um, Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Cape Girardeau, Missouri. That's why you're, why you're inducted into the Missouri Boxing Hall of Fame. Right. Yeah. When was that? 2010? Well, you're, ask, you're asking me? 2010. 2010. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty I, sure I, that's when it was. Okay. Yeah. I think it might have been 210, something like that. Yeah. yeah. So, how'd you get started in the sport? How'd you get started boxing? Actually, I think uh, I, I, I grew up in a John S. Cobb school where I went to first and second grade. At that time, you know, that was years ago. That was in the 40s. So, it was an all black school. So uh, I went to school in the John S. Cobb school. Uh, second grade, I was fighting all the time. I was always fighting. I seemed to have a natural act for getting a fight all the time. So the, they said, we, we can't, we, we brought my parents and my great aunt and uncle who raised me. They said, told me, said, this kid fights too much. I said, we, we're going to send him out of the school, you know, so. So, so that summer, and, and, and what had happened, I had, I guess in fighting, I had miss, missed so many days. I, uh, I, I, was missed, uh, I missed that year's grade. So I ended up going to summer school. And that's how I went to the Catholic school. I started going to Holy Family Catholic School in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. And, uh, and I started, I went to summer school. And, you know, then I moved on to the second grade. And uh, so that's why I started going to school at the Catholic school. And so... There, no change. I'm still fighting. I'm fighting people all the time. I'm always fighting. And the nuns say, oh, you like to fight so much. So what she did, she put me on the back wall and said, here, you like to fight so much, punch this wall. So she had me punching the wall. And 
man, I really got strictly interested in boxing then. You know, I just started hitting it and my hands got tough and I was, I was just starting by, it looked like I was, I was more of a natural than anything else. So I ended up being in the Golden Gloves, fighting in Sykeston, Charleston, Missouri, Cape Girada there. And so when in doing that, and uh, I won that and I ended up going to St. Louis and I fought up there, you know, and uh, a lot of good fighters there. And so, uh, but, you know, at the same time, uh, that, that, all that came about, and I was still fighting all the time, too. I'm, I just had a knack for wanting to fight, you know. Yeah. So for some reason, and, and I was small, too. And that was another thing. A lot of people could, thought they would pick on me, but they got fooled, you know. Yeah. What would you fight at? Flyweight, bantamweight? One, 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 112, 119, 125. And you had you, you had some success there, but then also you you boxed in the service too, right? I boxed in the service. I uh, I was all army, all service, world military game champion. Yeah, I won. I did a lot of. I ended up with two hundred and twenty fights. You know. Oh wow, wow, that's great. And, and then I fought from- in Europe. I won in all Europe and uh, stuff like that. You know, I fought what they called youth world championships, things of that ni- nature, and I got fight a lot in Scandinavia and a lot of the countries overseas yeah. in Germany and Africa. And so it worked out well for me, you know. And your nickname was Little Ray, right? Little Sugar, yeah. Little Sugar, Little Sugar, after, after Ray Robinson, right? Yeah, Ray Robinson, yeah. yeah. I had a friend of mine, he was, I was Little Sugar and he was Big Sugar, you know? <laughs> yeah. Okay, Ray Robinson, was he the greatest fighter of all time? I think so. You think Without so? I do too. I do too. I the most well-rounded. Was. Yeah, um, definitely. Just all around. And so then how did that, how did that being a, a fighter in the service translate into um, you coaching the Olympic team? Well, I, I think in 1972, I ended up getting sick. And uh, when I say sick, I had pericarditis. And uh, it just come unknown for some reason. It may, it may have happened when I was in Vietnam, but I don't know. But they had to remove a sack of my heart. So I said, dang, I'm going to, damn, I can't fight no more. And I said, yeah, I'm going to fight. So I went back and they, they, they sent me, the doctor checked me and said, no, you can't fight. So you ain't got no sack around your heart. So you can't fight. So you can't pass the test. I said, okay. So then I said, oh, well, let me try this coaching. So that's when I started coaching. I started coaching a company team in the military. I started coaching a company team. Then as time went on, I became, you know, good enough that I, I took over the post team at Fort Campbell and worked there and uh-huh. then after working there for quite a while then I moved to Fort Hood, Texas and really opened that program up like like becoming one of the best in the country, you know. So uh that's where I got blessed at, you know. Uh and had had a lot of people that helped me though. You know, it was like uh Pat Nappy was one of the coaches for the for the military. He afforded me the opportunity. Uh I learned a lot from a guy named uh uh, Byron Byron Walker, who I was one of my coaches in Germany, to include a guy from Coffeyville, Kansas, name uh, 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 what is his name? I that's what happened when you had too many fights. You, you kind of <laughs> was that forget, Bernie, but, Bernie Callahan? No, Bernie was he, also he, one of the, my great uh, people that I enjoyed, and it was a mentor like. Uh, but Carlton Brooks was the guy's name from Coffeyville, Kansas. Yep. Carlton Brooks, yes. So what kind of things did you learn from those guys? How did they help form you into the coach and trainer that you are now with the, your philosophy and your discipline? Technique, way of speaking, manner of speaking, uh, always pushing to the next level, but technique more than anything, very technical, because I was kind of, a, I was a technical boxer myself, and and I learned a lot from them, and that, that was a big big teaching for me really was a great teaching for me because Carlton Brooks was as you know from Coffeyville Kansas he was outstanding boxer had tremendous ability uh Bernie Callahan he was one of the guys that got killed in a plane crash in Poland if you remember he was also one of the guys that was very slick very formbonious he was I mean just a technique out of this world great great people you know so those are some of the people they have to be Walker, Callahan, Brooks have to be, and Bodine is another one from Louisiana. You have to be my greatest mentors, you know? Yeah. 
So you you are known for being a strict disciplinarian in the ring. Did that come from your time in the service or from the teachings and what you saw in these other coaches and trainers? Cut it out, please. I, I think it's from, I think it's from, uh, I don't know, probably my service thing too, because I was a drill sergeant also. So no pain, no gain. And at the same time, they got to follow orders, you know? So and that was what it is. I became a drill sergeant and I was, you know, and I'm an airborne ranger too. So I, I live the life of danger, you know what I mean? So uh, it's hardcore. You got to be in, but I just learned discipline too. Uh, I, that, that was the key. It always is the key, you know? So is, is that, you think that, is that what made that 84 Olympic team and then the 88 team into what they were? Was your, your, your strict approach? I don't, not so much my strict approach in the 84 team per se, but Pat Nappy being a former master sergeant himself, he brought that military atmosphere into the 84 Olympic team. And then me being one of the coaches, you know, I'll follow suit, you know, so there it is. And 88, definitely that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Now you're, you're somewhat, you're kind of recognized as being one of the first coaches to implement strength training and plyometric yeah. training into your workout programs. When did you, how did you develop that? Where'd that come from? And how did you implement that? Glad you asked. I learned that in Sandhoven, Germany at the German Olympic camp in 1972. When I was, was it went, first went to Germany and I was up in uh, Bavarian Alps in Sandhoven, Germany. And we were going to be fighting actually the German Olympic team or the German Bundeswehr. So I said, oh, and the guy said, well, we're, what we're going to do, what we'd like to do is we do some of your training and you do some of our training, let's mingle them. I said, okay, let's do that. So he said, we're going to do interval work. Interval work? What are you talking about? <laughs> so interval work was in the track, running around it, sprinting, doing 100 meter sprints and tr trotting around the track. That was a, a part of interval running. Then so he said, we're going to do strength and conditioning. Now, remember, that's 1972. Right. United States, they heard of that. So, boom. I said, uh, okay, good. So, we went through that. And I think they had an advantage over us also because that was our first time ever doing the strength and conditioning. And it, it didn't – our guys didn't fare well with it, but they did it because I said, we got to do this, and we're going to work with them. So, that's what we did. And that's – and, and that's why I come about saying I'm the first guy to ever introduce it to people in America and to USA boxing or US boxing strength and conditioning. And because that, I was the first to start using it in 72. Uh -huh. You, that's you what, remember that's some of the things that we did in that video when we uh -huh. were at Ring I do. one time. I do. Yes. Even then it was fairly fresh and new. Fresh, fresh and new, yes. Mm -hmm. Mobile, a lot of people did not particularly agree with it because they said, Weights was not the thing you used, but it wasn't heavy weights. It was small weights with a lot of repetition. That was the key. Being explosive. So explosiveness is what it yep. would bring about explosiveness, you know? So, so you feel like it took a while for the American team to develop that, to, you know, to um, be more open to it, well, it and to really pick it up? The Olympic Training Center, was there. they were in the process of using that at one time. They were using that. And they started using it quite a bit because I started doing it in the military. Matter of fact, when I went to first went to Fort Hood, 73, that's what I started using. That's why we were blasting everybody at, out all over the country. You know, you know, we were whooping everybody's butt, you know. So and that was the reason because my guys were just strictly in condition. You know, plus we had an advantage. We were we were boxers like 24 hours. You know what I mean? I got them all into a barracks. I had meals set up for them and everything. We eat in the facility on the base. They were they had a barracks where they stayed at, and and I'm up there at six o'clock in the morning, five thirty. Let's go. Got them on the runs, and then I got my days. I got Tuesdays and Thursdays, which I use as my strength and conditioning days. Strictly set up for that. Got to had all the equipment, and everything that I needed. Work work to a T, man. So they were pretty much just that's live, reason, sleep, drink, breathe. You know, that's the reason why I won the Nationals 81, yeah. 82 twice, 83, 84, 85, 
86, 87, 88. Unbelievable. Our Army team won the Nationals every year. Unbelievable. And yes, that sir. team, I mean, the 88 team, when you took over as head coach, I mean, you had, what, three gold medals, three silver, and like two, two bronze? bronze? Is that right? I don't know if that's... Well, we, is well, that, it should have been It should have been about six goals. Yeah. And we really got ripped off quite a bit. Well, Roy Jones got they, they robbed took that year. They, they, Roy Jones, yep. Arthur Johnson, I thought they got screwed, and Carver Hall, and Riddick Boat. I forgot about Michael All Carver Hall. All those yep. guys got messed around. As a matter of fact, let me give you a little story about that. While I was in Seoul, Korea, there were people that that were protecting the directors and, and some of the people that were there, mm-hmm. and they were like bodyguards that worked for the Pentagon, okay? And they were, the Pentagon being the military, head of the military in Washington, D.C. These guys were always walking around. I never understood that Hank said, Kenny, they're always following us. But I knew what would happen. I had ran my mouth. You know, I run my mouth all the time, you know, so <laughs> that's me. So the thing is, they said, uh, I had said, no, there were people trying to trip our guys when they were running with the American flag. Oh, wow. uh, I saw a guy giving somebody gold and money prior to fights. They were giving some to some judges, okay? And I said that in Korea. Uh-huh. They said, man, you better be careful, man. These people might try to do something to you. So I don't care. Just do it to me. You know, I ain't, I'm no worry. I said, but the thing is, but, and, and then at the same time, the Koreans came about and they said, okay, here's what we'd like to do today. Let's have a, let's have a big party and we'll have drinks and uh, not drinks, you know, just soda and, and a little food and stuff and music and have a little get together of American and, 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 and the Koreans. Okay. Yep. So, we all got together team wise, everybody camaraderie, shaking hands and hugging and all that little stuff. But that ain't satisfying nothing. You you started taking us to the to the to the to the to the, to the match, you know. Yeah. For yeah. no reason at all. They but they thought that was a way because they knew that they had been taking really screwing us, you know. Yeah. And, and 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 they were paying people on the side to 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 get to get us, you know what I mean? And that that truly happened. So you knew that heading into those fights, the Jones fight and all that, you knew that it was, the fix was in. Well, that, that's why I started getting to the point where I said, hey, we got to take these guys out of here. We got to take them out of there and just uh, hit, beat them so bad until it's just be one-sided, you know, completely. And, and you that, felt and the Riddick Bow, you felt the Riddick Bow fight was stopped too soon. It was stopped. It fitted between him and Lenny Lewis. It was prematurely stopped for no reason at all. Roy Jones, everybody knows he got ripped off. Stone ripped off. Arthur Johnson got ripped off. Carpa Hall got ripped off, you know? So it was just a shame, you know? It was, it was a shame it had to be that way, you know? Well, I remember watching the Jones fight. That was so blatant. I mean, they're just, we were, we were just in awe. Oh, yeah. Well, it, was, it was devastating for him. I, that kid, I didn't think, he, he talked like he was never going to fight again. Mm-hmm. Anything, you know, I didn't know. Yeah. Was, well, he considered yeah. not fighting, right? Yeah. Yeah. He did, but in spite of that, you still had you had a, you had the um, Kennedy McKinney, Kenneth Gould, uh, Anthony Hembrick, Ray Mercer. I mean, you mm-hmm. you come you walked away with with uh, Andrew Maynard, Andrew Maynard, yep, gold medalist, yep. So you you, uh, you fared pretty well in spite of the odds being against you. Yeah, we had three gold, three silver, and two bronze, which is not not bad. But I'd rather have had twelve golds. Right. <laughs> what you deserve, right? <laughs> Would re- yes. rather have what I deserve. They stole that from us. Yeah, yeah. So out of the, out of that group, just based on pure talent, who do, who would you have guessed had the most potential to move forward and become a world champion? I thought that Riddick, Roy, and McKinney, Carbajal, Johnson, uh, Hembrick. I thought, but once again. <clears throat> Once I had, <clears throat> excuse me, although I had trained him, Rick, some, <clears throat> sometimes it's a mindset that really and truly <clears throat> affects people more so than the ability. Uh-huh. You know what I'm saying? It's their atmospheric way that they do things. It's kind of like <clears throat> attitude and things of that nature. It don't move you to that next level. And I think maybe that may 
had been the problem with some of them. And as a whole, <clears throat> I thought all of them had great ability. He showed in their professional world, Carbajal world champion, Johnson world champion, McKinney world champion, uh, Kelsey Banks could have made it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's hard headed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 like it is. Yeah, yeah. 32, uh, Ramallah Sellers uh, yeah. had ability. Once again, I think it, you know, a lot of times people can say what they want to say. And people can might listen to me and say to me, say, well, you're a little cocky and hard-headed. Well, training makes a difference. And if you got the right trainer behind you, you can be a difference. And people can say what they want. I don't care what they say because I got 29 royal champions to prove who I am. So <laughs> I see no, I don't care. You know, but, they can say yeah. that. But I'm saying the point is, is that most people, <clears throat> training makes a big, big difference in it. Yeah. And the way that you approach training makes a difference in how you teach a guy to take a particular style that he takes, what's more beneficial for him. And that mm -hmm. makes a big, big difference. And like they said, a great jab, a savior all day long. And I'm a believer in that. Yeah. I got a guy, all my people, you have great jabs. And that's, yeah. that's what I work toward and all the other things work in. And I like to be a little slick in what I do. I learned from Jersey Joe Walcott, Sugar Ray Robinson, Muhammad Ali, Willie Pep, and these are great fighters. Willie Pep, a fighter that won around without throwing a punch. Yeah, that is that is the that is the story. And so, is that true? These are these. That's a true fact. Yeah. He won the fight because his defense was so great. The guy didn't hit him, but he didn't try. He just touched him every now and then, you know. Yeah. So it was enough for him to win around. Well, so, I think I'm just yes. Yeah, no, Eddie Futch had said once, you know, I think you, this is kind of what you touched on right here, is that he said, you don't want to mess with a guy too much. You know, fine-tune him, but don't completely change his style. Each fighter has their own personality and their own kind of uh, basic makeup. And I think that's kind of what... Improving on what he's got. Uh-huh. Improving on what he's got. Uh, the, that's the key that you want to do. You know, he's got a style. You don't want to change that, but you improve on what he's doing. Because he's got it or he don't have it. You know what I mean? So how much of your job Captain is... Captains that I made, they're born in most cases. You believe that? I, yeah, I believe that. But you they're just... They're born, not made. But you've, you also feel, and you touched on that, that if, if without the right trainer, that might not, yeah. not materialize. Yeah. Well, like that, that adds a part to it. You, do, you, you got to have the right... You got to have the right teacher, for sure. So Make who's your... Who was your first world champion then? Rene Jacob from France. And he beat Rene um, He beat Donald Curry. Donald Curry. It was like an upset of the year, yeah. right? Yeah. Upset of the year. Yeah. 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 And the, Many moons that, um, ago. What's that? Many moons ago. When was that? Do you remember? 1989. And you're 89. And your first American champion was Eddie Cook, right? Eddie Cook, huh? Yeah. So how many guys were you training at that, ta at that time besides those two guys? Uh, probably about 15. Of, the, of those, the names were like who? Okay. Uh, let's start from the, if I start from the weight class, I didn't said <laughs> London, London at 106, Eddie Cook at 12, McKinney at 19, 25 was Frank Pena, 32 at that time was Skipper Kelp, 39 was, uh, I don't know, remember quite who my 39 was, but uh, my 47 was uh, Brian, the, one of the London brothers, uh, because I had both of them in the military with me uh, from Dallas, Texas. 56-pounder uh, at that time was, uh, don't remember offhand. I don't think I know if I even had one. I moved up to the next weight class I had was that I really started out with them was I had started them, uh, but Al Cole and Al Ray Mercer, but they didn't, they, we had two, two sets up that we had at that time, top rank and Mark Roberts, who had the triple, triple threat, which were in Atlantic city. And we had the Las Vegas gloves in cooperation, which was here. So Hank Johnson and Murkison worked with me here with these other guys that I eventually brought in and then Mercer 
Cole and Charles Murray, they really actually belonged to the guy who was their manager who lived in New Jersey. So it was called a triple threat. So they stayed here and trained for a while. Then after a few fights, then they moved to Atlantic City, New Jersey. And that's when Hank and Arthur Murkison went up to Atlantic City and started working with them in the triple threat. So those were my first beginnings. But I had I had an abundance of people there, Skipper Kemp, Frank Pena, Kennedy McKinney, Al Cole, Ray Mercer, uh, Brian Lennon, Greg Lennon. Uh, who else did I have? Uh, oh, oh, some, some I, mean, what, I can't what remember a, the name. What a lineup. I mean, that's, that's – uh... That's pretty amazing. And that was just a test. You're 80, or 80 years old. I think your memory is probably better than mine. <laughs> I'm taking plenty of medicine. I'm taking plenty of medicine. I can't so, remember who I am sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so how much you like some things, uh, do you implicate in, you, uh, implement in, in your, in your training in that, uh, as far as approaching a fight, do you, do you, do you study films? Do you, do you look at the other opponents? How much do you do that? How much does that apply to, I, to your I training pay, set I, strategy? I pay a very strict attention. I like to see a guy's fight so I can figure out a strategy to beat him, see where his weaknesses and his strengths are, uh, what I can do with him, how to try to set up training that way. Uh, so I try to teach my fighter to beat him, and, and I'm a believer, and, and I went a long way, way back in looking at tapes and strictly strategizing to beat a guy. And – a lot of times it just pays off a hundred percent and I'm a believer in that. And, uh, yeah, you, you got to look at tapes and figure out ways to beat him where you move left or right, where you move to his power hand, hook hand. Is he a hooker? Is he a boxer? What he has? So I, that's the way I do. I, 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 I look at tapes and, and, and definitely believe in preparing for guys. Do you have the fighter look at him too, or you just look at him and you you implicate the? I look you, at him and I teach plan. him what he needs to. I want him to look at it too. I mean, I don't I don't want to be with him and emphasize. I want him to try to pick out some things that he sees, and we'll take it and discuss them, and go over them, and work on on, on strengthening uh, what is his strengths and his weaknesses, and try to take advantage of them. You know what I mean? Right. And see whether he moves left, moves right, where he's a power puncher. Good jab or a hooker, right hand, and if he's left handed or right handed, you know, we want to prepare for that, you know. That's interesting. So you look at it separately, so the two of you then come together, having looked at it from a different perspective, and maybe different bring different different and talk about different them. perspectives to it. Right. Because yeah, he may he may pick up something I may have missed, you know, and mm -hmm. vice versa, you know. So we look at that, but then then I'll then I'll still go ahead and break down everything as it should be done. Yeah. And so I thought I would just want him to implement it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Primarily. Well, and because of that approach, that's why you said nobody beats you twice, right? That's why you've always nobody said that. Nobody beats me twice. No. Is that true? Nobody ever did beat you twice, any of your fighters? No, sir. Wow. I guess I never fought too many people twice though, either. So <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't matter. But, I, but that was just a saying. That was just a part of psychology I was using then. Yeah. Saying, well, what had happened was that Casa Zoo had boxed one of my kids from South Africa, Jan Bergman. And uh, so he had beaten him in, uh, in, in Australia, Australia. So when we came to Atlantic City, and uh, I think I was at the Trump Tower, as a matter of fact. And uh, he said uh, Vlad Wharton was the, the, you know, the manager for Casa Zoo. He says, uh, he walks over and we go to the line, I shook hands and he said, can you have we meet again. I said, nobody beats me twice. And so, <laughs> so, so, when, so when the fight was over, I walked over to him. I said, I told you nobody beats me twice. Yeah. So that was it, you know. Now you've also, I mean, I just want to hear your perspective on this. You've also dealt with some fighters that have had some substance abuse issues, which yes. some fighters often do. Um, among those were I mean, Johnny Tappy, of course. Um, I think Vince Phillips had some issues with that. Uh, Kennedy McKennedy, uh, and maybe mm -hmm. you lost those as being the greater, greater, as not being as good a fighter as they could have been because they battle with that. How did you deal with that out there, their struggles outside the ring? Well, in noticing this, I'm not proud of that. 
But I knew even before they turned professional, even as amateurs, quite a few of those kids were on drugs. Uh huh. Really? I did not, I didn't approve of it. But once again, I guess you say a bird in the hand. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I thought I could possibly get them off of it also and improve on them and help them make a life for themselves because so many of these kids, they not that they're dummies, but you know, the point is that there's a lot of money to be made in boxing. So hopefully that was a way for them to make a living. Uh, so what I did do though, even when, even in the military, I had very strict, I paid attention to them. I had them all in one barracks. Uh, and I had NCO always had one stay overnight to make sure everybody kept themselves in order. They got made bed check. And I would breeze in every day at night and then 10 o'clock bed check, wake up at six o'clock in the morning to run. Uh, and I also had a meal, I had a dining facility for them. I had them on separate rations. What we call in the military is that you get extra money because I said, what I'd like for them to do is have the extra money as to where they can get food of their liking. In other words, something they, a taste they would like to have to eat mm -hmm. to make sure they're eating the proper food once again. But separate rations is you get extra money and you can buy the food that you want. You don't have to just eat what they got in the mess hall or in the facility. So that would give us an added thing, especially since they only eat, I program to eat twice a day, morning and evening. And I, I, I had learned that from Callahan, Nappy, and all over the years, I had learned that, uh, the, the way to do it. So it worked out fine. So those are the things that I did. But uh, all in all, you're talking back to the drug situation. Uh, same thing when I turned professional, there were a few guys here. So what we ended up doing is that I had a guard for them, a big guy, and uh, weighed about 230, about six seven. What did I do? I had him go. I had him go all the way out to uh, Pahrump and he would take them out and they would stay in hotels out there. He tried to keep them away from the, the big city and keep them away from uh, the drug scene, you know. Um, huh. But all, all the regimen and did control. It, did, it work? Only, did, it, did it work? Did it work? Did it work? Hell mm -hmm. no. But <laughs> we tried it. And then I took him, I even took him to Mount Charleston and put them up over there, had them guarded. Did it work? Hell no. Mm -hmm. So it's like a point is that <clears throat> you're rocking a hard place. You know, they, they're deep over the kids were good enough. They could, uh, they, they were monsters. Phillips was a monster and Vince, but, but I can say this much. If these kids had never, ever dealt with drugs, how great they could have been. Yeah. That's what you, you got to wonder. And, and still they were great. One mm -hmm. of the guys, a gold medal, the first guy, to win one in, in his weight class from the United States ever, except for the one guy that won one but didn't fight for it. But the thing is that, uh, it, it, and, and become world champions. I looked at one of the fights yesterday with Vince Phillips and Costa Zoo. And, and I remember that. We why I remember that very well because I almost got in trouble. They, went, they got crack houses here in Las Vegas, you know, and I ain't calling the name where they're at, but the place where they're at. I walked in and said, you got my man in here. I want him out. And they say, hold it. You're going to walk in my establishment and tell me you want to get out? You know, I said, no, it don't work like that. I said, well, you're right. I said, but I'll tell you what. Same thing you got on you, I got on me. So I had my pistol with me too. So the thing was, if it needed to war zone, we had to do that. And I didn't want that. No, of course not. But the point is, is, but I said, he said, but you, you're in here this time. He said, you can't come in here no more. I said, I got you. I've been warned. And I understand that. I didn't go in anymore. Yeah. But he left with you, huh? Huh? But he left with you. He better left with me. Yeah. He was a gone <laughs> boy. He was been over for him. If he's going to leave with me, he was fired. Yeah. But it really comes down to as much control and a regimen you can create as much as you try to control the environment, a fighter's going to do what he's going to do, right? I mean, at the end of the day. Yes. You can't bet him in 24-7. Yeah. You just can't. It's just, it's just hard. Unless 
what is your life going to be like when you you're locked up with him? You know, of course, in the military, I was doing that too. I had a barracks, just all boxers, and I lived in one of the bedrooms. You know, I had myself and my assistants live in the bedroom, so we lived in the same area, same building. You know, but uh, you can't civilian life like this. You can't do that. Well, it's there's just no life for anybody. You know, right? Well, you, you got to wonder: is that why maybe? I mean, there's probably several factors. But is, is that maybe why the Olympic uh, teams haven't had as much success? There's just too many distractions. No, I'm gonna tell you the biggest part. The biggest, the biggest problem: lack of coaching. <laughs> lack of coaching. Okay, I'm gonna tell yeah. it just like it is. Yeah. And if anybody out there will, don't believe me, say it. Come to me. I'll say I said it. Lack of coaching. So Disciplinarian and getting in a fight, huh? In what way? In what lacking? Lacking in what areas? They got. They got. They got to be disciplined, to a guy. You, you. You can't pin play play penny penny with guys. You got to be. You got to discipline people, and they have to be disciplined. If you want to be a fighter, you got to be disciplined. That takes it. Uh, that's the key to boxing: disciplinarian and ability. You got to have them both, and you, you need them both. I mean, you, it, you can be the best teacher in the world, but if a guy goes out here and Drinks liquor all night, or smokes weed all night. What can you? What you got then? Nothing. Zero. Nothing for nothing. Leaves nothing. And uh, and and another thing, our, our 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 level has not moved like it should. I hate to say this, but we just don't have it like we used to. Maybe they don't make the fighters, because I think there's some good trainers out there, but the fighters are not like they used to be either. Is it in what they're, they're taught? Is it the training style? Is I it think, the, I think the that's fighting the style they're I teaching think, them? Or I think that's it. I, I think people take they, they learn how to walk a guy from A, B to C to D. You got to teach them the basic punches: the one, the jab, the right hand, the hook, and the uppercuts. Block, parry, catch, slip, rock and roll, and all that. You got to teach them that. We and that's what we're hurting for. We're hurting for teachers. The fundamentals. Teachers are the Teaching, key. We uh, need teachers. Yeah. We need teachers. Well, why is that lacking? I think, where is, where I think is that you can, got lost? I think you, Doug, I think you know that. You've been yeah. around in long enough to know. You can see that. We don't have teachers. A guy can grab a towel and put it over his shoulder and got a whistle. Don't make you a trainer. So where'd that, how's that come missing? Where, where, where's the gap? Where, where'd we lose that? I guess it's different in philosophies. People's philosophies are different, but, and you don't have one particular one that you can follow. Yeah. You know, but everybody is different, teaches a little different. You can come in this gym here, and everybody, every coach would teach a little different. Of course, there's more ways to skin a cat. There's more than one way, no doubt about that. You know, but the key is that once again, is that there's a basic punching basic teaching that you have to do the jab the right hand the hook and the uppercuts the same way block parry catching moving slipping sliding you must learn to do that people Again. have to teach that and repetition is, is, over and over that's another key factor repetition is very important so is it because the fundamentals and repetition isn't fun it's not taught it's just it's not, not taught. taught because people yeah. don't know they don't know they what they have learned is what they have done, and it is not always right. Mm -hmm. And so they're just passing oh, I guess on what, what I do. They don't make it right either. But proven fact is that my pudding speaks for itself. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm just saying that in a sense. You know, and is that is that matter? And I'm not I'm not a braggadocious. I'm a well. My wife calls me a narcissist because. I love her so much. I'm on top of her all the time. You know, <laughs> I don't mean it like that <laughs> in a sense of speaking, but uh, I'm just saying that's the way it rolls. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, uh, no, but that's, uh, th that's the problem. Uh, uh, it's, it's just, you, you need far and in between is, uh, to have on the same level that you get. Uh, and, 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 and I won't, and I won't call a lot of names, but I got a kid and he's from Springfield, Missouri, Brandon Woods, you know him? You don't, don't know the him. Name but sounds you're familiar, know him. but I don't name. Him. You're really? gonna know him, and and he, he from Springfield, Missouri, also, and he now has moved to the University of Arkansas to take over their boxing program, 
and watch their program start blossoming. Watch their program blossom. University of Arkansas. Remember, I said that. We're going to take notes. We're going to we're going to we're going to mark that moment. So yes, you sir. also worked with some fighters that were were a little, a little bit out there, have a reputation for just being a little bit out there. You had uh, Valero, Capia, mm -hmm. Michael Bent. Mm -hmm. What were yeah. what were some of the stories? What were some of the issues that were surrounding those guys? Was it just instability of home life, uh, again, lack of structure, um, too many temptations? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with structure. Uh, growing up, when a guy can just, when a guy is just, got so much talent that he just can fight. Just like Valero. Mm -hmm. Valero oh, just man. could fight. Oh, he was just such a fighter. 29 and no, 29 knockouts, 19 the first round. Could he fight? One heck of a fighter. And never let, never did like anybody beat him up in the gym or sparred him with bigger, larger people. He was just, just tremendous. Worth ethics out of this world. And had two kids, beautiful kids and a beautiful wife. Uh, and I just don't believe he killed her, but they said he did. I don't even believe he hung himself either. They said that too, but I don't, I don't believe that. I, I thought he cared too much for himself, although he had a problem to drink a little bit and, and he would do crazy things, never allowed nobody to beat him in the runs, nobody to beat him up in the gym. That was the kind of guy, he was just competitive, very strong competitive, but uh, I, I don't know. Uh, and, 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 you know, in this boxing game, uh, I was pretty stern and strict with him. And, and he was, but he was a good kid and it, it, he did everything you wanted him to do mm -hmm. in the yeah. boxing world. And I guess that's what you're looking for. And, 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 and while he was in Vegas here, he was, he was pretty calm and pretty good, good, good mention. But once he moved back into the wild city of California, Nothing wrong with California, but once he moved back there, it just was a little different, a little different life for him. And, you know, it's uh, I think he got to running around, you know, and then people get a little personal sometimes too. You know, it's like at the management people you had, they said, well, Kenny, you've moved him along real good and everything, but you know, they come to me with this junk, like we want to get him back with his kind, his kind. What do you, what do you call, what is his kind? Because the other guy, because he is Hispanic like him, that, why you, that, what that has nothing to do with the ability of boxing? But that came about, and and that's why he moved back to California. And then he got in trouble, then. And when he got in big trouble, when he went back to Venezuela, because you know I'm a disciplinarian, so I had Valero at a dis, as a disciplinarian, and I had my strength guy also, which was named Ray Woods, who was another. Tough, tough, good guy. Uh, he's an ex undercover policeman who was take care of business, and he's another one that make would uh, Edwin walk the chalk too. So we had a disciplinarian house working for him, and yet and still, he and he had two kids, and it was everything was fine with him, you know, and he was coming along good, and he he take him. Get him a little Viagra pill every now and then yeah. too, you know, <laughs> which is funny as hell. Coach, I'll give you one of them Viagras. I'm gonna take me a Viagra and and work out, you know. And that's what he would do. Cause that was the kind of guy he was. I mean, don't get me wrong. He was. It wasn't about no sex or anything like that. It was just about him taking a Viagra pill that would pump him up, you know, Energy, and get him yeah, motivated. Yeah. I guess, you know, yeah. he just that's wanted hilarious. that, you know. So <laughs> he was hilarious, you know. But a one heck of a fighter. Yeah, well, and imagine what he could have become again. Oh, yes, what he could have, could have been if the potential just, was. Straight and narrow would have been him. Yeah. Uh, he had his demons, though. He definitely had his demons. No doubt. No doubt he had don't, his demons. Don't you think most fighters do, though, in some sense? Yes, they do. I mean, yeah, it's part of what drives a human being to to fight and have pick this as a career? Yes, I guess you're right. Yeah. I mean, somewhat. You're looking at one. I, I got a problem. <laughs> well, it, yeah, we're we're all in this for one reason. I love winning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's also a trait. I think Ray Leonard talked a little bit about that. He felt like that was the biggest driving factor. He just loved the he loved the feel of yeah. competition and winning and beating another another man in the ring. Yeah, he. You know, that was a great guy. I spent a lot of time. You know, he was my. You know, he was my. Uh, my 
what do you call the guy that's your mentor, like your advisor? He was my advisor for the 88 oh. Olympic team, you know. Oh, I didn't know and that. He's, I, I spent, oh, yeah. I, I have a lot of, I have a picture. I, I have spent a lot of time with Sugar Ray. I, I, speak, I just spoke to him about a couple of weeks ago. We, we talk often. So he was my advisor for the 88 Olympic team. But once again, he stayed with me for a while up until the term of getting ready got started. And then people accused him of trying to drag Maynard off of the team and stuff. And then that's when he bowed out. He said, well, Kenny, I just can't. I'm not going to do this. People are saying, and I'm, I got an inside job here that, that I can pick to the fighters that I choose or whatever. He said, but I'm not in here for that. So, it, and I didn't think he was either, you know, but, but why not? You know, he's in the business of becoming a manager. Why not? If he's in the position, why not pick this guy and that guy? And there's nothing wrong with that, really, you know. But uh, that was accused of him. He was accused of that. But, now nah, he was good people, man. And uh, really, I got along well with him, you know. Yeah. Well, he's coming up on uh, this next year since the Olympics got moved to 2021. That will be the anniversary year of his winning the gold medal. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's good. That's cool. great. Yeah. 76, yeah. Yeah. So you're yeah. you're probably working on your you've you've said you've been you've been retiring here for the last what 10 15 years, yeah. But you just can't get out of the game. So no, I can't. But the nice thing is you know you're, you you're, know why you can be very you know selective why? about who you work with. What why? Because uh, I see people screw so many people up and it just burns <laughs> me up. Yeah, I hear it you. It burns me up. I, I can't take you. it. Oh man, he's doing the wrong thing. And but who am? Well, say who am I? Okay, check my record. Anyway, uh, narcissism, my wife says. But anyway, all that's good. Uh, the point is, is that uh, I hate to see people mess people up. Mm -hmm. I ask, I wonder why people, I, I, hey, people, I don't care if people get mad and, and they know me and hear me or whatever. If I see a person do something, it doesn't make sense. Doing it for what? There's a basic way to box and there is another way to box, period. And and see what happens is a lot of people just grab a tile and put it over their shoulder and they, they're a coach or a trainer. It's not like that. It, it's a little different than that. It's a little bit different. So it's hard to walk you away because you feel like knowledge. you can, con you can continue to be a positive influence and help other people. I, I do believe that. And uh, I do believe that. Yep. And, and, I, and I work cause I'm a hard worker too. And I, and, and I'm not a, I'm not a guy to try to skip anything. I want, you know, like I have about four or five different runs here. I have the guys for, for running. I have certain days that I do running and strength and conditioning. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday is my strength and conditioning days. Actually, and I use, I'm sorry. I use Tuesday and Thursday is my conditioning days. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday is sparring as much as possible. Uh, and I also have like to see them run. Monday, Tuesday, off Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Saturday, I like to have it as a, I like to take them to the track on a Saturday or track or a long, heavy run. I got one here that is over at, uh, it's, a, it's a deep run. It's about 200 meters up like this here and steps and run up them, do push-ups at the end of each 10 steps, stamina, conditioning, and endurance. That's what that involves. And uh, I like to do that about, maybe once or twice a month. I have another one I use uh, over at the track. I use the track also. I use 12 laps where they sprint the 100 meters and I have them also sprint the curves. Every other one, one sprint, 100. Next time they go sprint the corners and I do three miles there, 12 laps. So I have certain runs and things that I do and I try to gear myself up to four weeks to five weeks of training off in the land and sparring Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And I have a routine that I use, like I said, in Saturday, all they do is run. It's a hard driven run. They run around the track in most cases, or either go to Majestic Park and run there or Red Rock and run, or I take them over to UNLV and run around the track. Uh, and like I said, my strength and conditioning days, Tuesdays and Thursdays in the gym, uh, you know. So I, I, that's a routine I try to work around. And and the week before they fight, they don't do any sparring, and they quit their strength and conditioning. All they do is run. 
Yeah. And that formula has worked. Huh? And that formula has so, worked. It has worked. Yeah. It's so worked you're, for quite a few times. So, you know, so. Yeah. I'm pleased. Well, again, it. you're at the point now where you're very selective with who you work with. Who 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 you got on tap that you're excited about? Is there anybody special? You're training now at the DLX gym? Yes. DLX gym. Uh, wonderful gym. Nice. Close to my house. Seven minutes away. I love that. Uh, that's know. good. <laughs> And 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 the owner, I've been knowing her off and on for quite a while. I uh, I met her years ago over at uh, Round One, which was on Sahara and uh, Fort Apache years ago. Uh, and I've been knowing her for quite a while, and uh, she's a good person. So, uh, you know, it's, it it works out well. We got a we're, we're all on the same sheet of music. Everything is good here. You know, beautiful. So, yeah. So. As we wrap up here, if you had like a bit, you know, you talk about, you know, some of the trainers today are missing the basics, the technique and the, the right approach from the start. So what advice would you give an aspiring trainer or somebody who's in the beginning throes of becoming a coach? You know, how do they get there? How do they how do they gain that knowledge and know that they're teaching the right thing um, in the right way? Well, one one way to do it, probably, of course, I know we all are. How can I say it? Uh, <laughs> you you try to get some understudies guys that work with you yeah. and things of that nature. But the only thing about that sometimes, uh, they get beyond themselves sometimes. So I, that's why I've always worked as a loner for so long. And, and, and then at the same time, if you got somebody behind you that works with you, you want him to be on the same sheet of music. That's why me and Brandon work so good together because we were on the same sheet of music. But when you got a guy you're working with that's not on the same sheet of music with you, that creates a problem. Yeah. Why did he do this? Oh, because as the coach told me not, oh man, come here, man. You yeah. know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. give him a few little untoned words that you don't want to speak around everybody, you know, and all those <laughs> good things. But anyway, uh, that's why I'm basically a loner. I don't really, really, truly work with anybody in per se. The basic guy that I work with is I'll have a strength and conditioning guy is normally what I'll have with me in most cases because I'd rather for him to do that uh, on that. I had one guy once, but uh, he uh, he was working he was working real good. But you know, other people around get a little jealous and things of that nature, and it creates a problem. You know, so then you got to separate and cut this but uh you know the, the boxing is very vindictive people know and understand that and uh and 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 everybody does have their own philosophy and there's more than one way to skin a cat you know so the thing is that uh, people do teach different not saying mine is always right you know but it, i ain't been right for 23 27 28 times so it must be doing something right so you know uh i don't know i i just uh I see people do things sometimes. And I'm not sure why, and I, 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 I even question. I say, why do you do that? Why? <laughs> what is your purpose? Uh -huh. What is your purpose? Uh, hmm. Oh, let's talk about it then. You know, and because I do like to see people be perfectionists in this game, because in the in the sport of boxing, we're you know, Doug, we're in the sport of boxing. We want to be proud of what we see. You know. When our Olympic time comes up, we want to be saying, hey, I like that, you know, uh, you're proud of that, you know, and uh, and, and that's why, and, and, and it's such a hard thing for people too, and that's why I like to be in the sport of boxing. I like to see everything good from the people that actually, the referees, the judges, and the people that do their business, that's why I'd like to hate to see them make mistakes, give the wrong guy to fight, uh, the wrong flip be called a knockdown and things of that nature. I like for everybody to be on top of their on top of their game, you know. And that and I, I'm looking for a perfectionist, you know, and you might not get it one thousand percent, but hopefully you do. And just like the job that you do, you, you do a great job in, 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 in equipment wise and everything. You get all all your equipment is good and everything. 
And that's why people come to title because they like to deal with it, you know? And so, and, and that's important. And you don't want to go to, to a Tom, Dick and Harry over here. You want to go to title. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, we're, we're constantly working to improve and become better. And that's, that's really what it's yeah. about in this game, in the sport, on any, whatever side you're on. Yes. True. Should be the ultimate goal. So on the other side of it, if, if a fighter came to you and said, coach Adams, I want to become a world champion. What do I have to do? Can you boil that down? Is there a formula for that? Well, another thing, the guy has to have a little ability and he has to, uh, I, I put another rubber try, which I talk about weapons is that you got to have cojones too. Yeah. That takes, that's one of the big desire and determination. And, uh, and if you got that, a lot of times uh, you can overcome anything, uh -huh. you know, you can be overcome life, you know, huh? Yeah, yeah. that's a good point. And be, and be having the, the inclination the to outwork to everybody else. Listening yeah. for and, sure. And, yeah. and want to listen, listen and yep. try to pick and, 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 and don't get to the point where you think you know everything, you know, yeah. when you get to that point, you're in a problem, you got a problem, you know, unless you Sugar Ray Robinson, Sugar Ray Leonard, or right. one of them right. type guys, you know, right. So, and that story, goes you know, for so. a coach or a fighter, you know, there's yeah, always room to grow and learn. Know, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And try not to be, well, I guess when you know what you know, what you know, when you know what you know, when you know what you know. <laughs> <laughs> what can you say? <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. <laughs> see, see, hey, I, I admit to people that I'm a narcissist because I know my... Oh, I don't care. I, I got myself together. I don't care. I know this game. I know because I, I had 200 fights. I know what I'm talking about. I've been through it. I didn't train everybody from Tom to Dick to Harry. So, I, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, I, I, I train teams. I train in the military. I train teams and they were disciplined. And I'm taking guys from a zero to a hero, you know, and and, and, and I ain't trying to pat myself on the back. I just know, I know who I am. I'm 80 years old, so I've been through life a couple of days, you know, and I've been through a few wars for real, yep. you know what yeah. I mean? Right, I spent 30 right. years and seven months in the military, so, yeah. and I'm yeah. an airborne ranger, and I live the life of danger. I understand all that. So I try to I try to move it to the next level. And then on my point is, I want somebody that's disciplined. The guy's going to be, going to listen. And and if he's not, I'm gonna move away. Right. And I I moved away from a lot of people. And uh and I have a long list of guys that I've trained over the time. I've trained some of the best the United States has ever had, you know, period, you know. And 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 I think some are gonna get better. And and, and I've been and trained a lot of other countries. I've worked mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the Russians I've worked with, Uzbek Uzbek people. I've did a whole lot. I've did a lot with the well, I've, I've trained people from all, from every country. I trained people from the Philippines. I trained people from Mexico, and all around. You know, so mm -hmm. and I never had a problem with it with the fighter per se. The only problem I have is what time he gets in and what time, how long he's gonna stay out, and uh, <laughs> that could be a problem. You know, right? So uh, <laughs> it's outside. Because I, I am a disciplinarian. That's one thing I am. I am very disciplined, and, and I'm the key. And uh, and I may use them four letter words sometime too. You know, I do them often enough, but I've heard, I've heard a few me. of those. That's <laughs> just, that's just me. You know, that I just can't help that. You know, I, I grew up in that atmosphere. Like I said, that's really the way I, I, why I said, I learned. That's why I started boxing. Uh, but I, I got at the Catholic church. I told you the story, right? I, I got kicked out of school. Right. Uh -huh. yep. yep. I got kicked out of the, out of the public school. I went to the Catholic school. And the nun had me start punching the wall. And that's why I started really getting into boxing. I saw I can do this. So I started really fighting and fighting. I said, and she, she, she made a, she made a monster out of me. You know what I mean? So that's you, the way it you, amounted to. Do you think that you coming as a fighter into, into the training field that made you a better trainer? Do you think that impacted you at all? Cause there are a lot of guys that don't, they don't have any background or they don't have any boxing experience but they learn from, you know, whatever other different avenues. Do you think that made you a better trainer having had that experience? I'm not so sh Okay. I can tell you, I'm not so sure because I can tell you one of the greatest 
trainers uh, of the Olympics, and especially for the United States, was Pat Nappy. Uh-huh. None whatsoever boxing ability. Never fought a day in his life. But Pat Nappy was a disciplinarian, had a good head on him. But what he was smart enough to do again is that he, he got people that knew boxing that would come in and teach that. But Nappy was in charge, and he was very much a disciplinarian, okay? And he was one of the few that, so he didn't personally teach fighters, but he knew how to yell at them and get the maximum out of them. And he was a very disciplinarian. That's where 10 o'clock bed checks start learning. You couldn't go to clubs. You couldn't be around, you wasn't supposed to be around mm -hmm. the women in, in those uh -huh. particular time. And they would put you in a barracks and pull guard on you almost, you know? And, uh, very disciplined, very, very disciplined. Uh, had no time. You had to be a bed check at 10 o'clock, whole nine yards, you know? And, uh, you know, that's what Nappy, Pat Nappy was a disciplinarian. And just goes to show you, but Nappy was smart enough, and that's why you give him a lot of credit, is is that he he brought Carlton Brooks, uh, you know, uh, Jimmy Grant, a whole lot of other people. And I became one of them in the 84 Olympic team. He was small enough to bring people. He got George Washington that he brought in also to be one of his trainers. Uh, and, and like I said, and that was the key, you know, and uh, he, he, he uh, what he didn't know, he had, he had somebody else to knew, you know, what to mm -hmm. do. Well, Kenny, you are a good friend. You're a boxing yeah. icon, a living legend. Uh, appreciate you taking the time to, to talk with us. Um, you, you, again, you're just an inspiration, your continued commitment to the sport. And you're, you're just one of boxing, good guy, uh, boxing's good guys and, um, appreciate all you've brought to the game. Well, it's a pleasure, man. And, uh, appreciate talking to you and we've been good friends. We have never ever had to say a bad word to each other, anything. We've always gotten along all the many, many years that we've known each other and it's all good. And I'm happy that you brought me in to do this and, uh, God bless, and I hope it goes well. Uh, and I want to thank the Miss Trudy here from DLX for allowing us the opportunity to be the best we can. For sure. Just like for sure. That's like they say in the army: be the best you can. Because only the strong <laughs> survive. The weak fall by the wayside. Lots of good times. Happy 80th, Kenny. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you for watching this episode of Title Unboxed. If you're anything like me, you can never get too much boxing. So if you'd like to watch more episodes, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and our Title Boxing YouTube page.